They held up a camera and there was Earth rising over the lunar surface. That to this day is the most recognized photograph of anything at any time, of any object, Earthrise. You go to the moon, you look back, and it's a whole new perspective. We went to the moon to explore it, but in fact, we discovered Earth for the first time. Uh, now, why am I asked to deliver this commencement address? I, I think it's because of my association, my long association as sort of a follower and advisor of NASA. And it was announced that this is the 100th anniversary, the closing of the 100th year of the founding of the school. It's also the closing of the 50th year of the famous speech given by President Kennedy in Rice Stadium to an audience of, audience of 35,000 people titled, We Choose to Go to the Moon speech. That very phrase appears in the speech and it is followed by the phrase, not because it's easy, but because it's hard. That speech was delivered here on the campus of Rice University. That was delivered a year after President Kennedy announced that maybe the moon is something we should do, some place we should go to. That was first announced in Congress, May 25th, 1961. We were spooked into him saying that. Six weeks before that speech, the Soviet Union launched Yuri Gagarin into orbit. As I tweeted about a year ago, Yuri Gagarin was the fifth mammal to achieve this feat. After a dog, a chimp, a few mice, and a hamster. <laughs> but the point there is, in that speech, that's where he uttered the phrase, we will put a man on a moon, return him safely to Earth before the decade is out. That's kind of all he said about the moon in that speech. The whole plan got laid out in Rice Stadium a year later. So you can say, oh, we had charisma and will and political motivation back then, until you look at the beginning of that speech he gave to Congress. Three paragraphs, two or three paragraphs before he says, we'll go to the moon, he says, the events of recent weeks, Yuri Gagarin going into orbit, if those are any indication of the impact of this adventure on the minds of men everywhere, then we need to show the, path, show the world the path to freedom over the path to tyranny. It was a battle cry against communism. People were spooked. NASA got founded a year after Sputnik was launched, motivated by a Cold War climate. So what happens? President Kennedy gives his let's go to the moon speech in Rice Stadium. A year later, Rice donates the land that is Johnson Space Center. That is the seat of the astronaut program of NASA. Rice University was there at the beginning of this epic adventure to the moon. Now I've studied this, what drives people to do things. I've looked throughout all of time, all of human time, and I found only three drivers that get people to do things in a big way. One of them is war. That's obvious to any political analyst. War makes you spend money like it's a flowing river. Even when you don't have money, you spend the money like it's a flowing river. War, one of the great motivators of human conduct. A next motivator is money. So the first is I don't want to die. The next one is I don't want to die poor, right? Two great motivators in the history of human cultures. There's a third motivator much less revealed in the world today, and that's the praise of royalty and deity. That's what gets you the pyramids in Egypt and the, the church building and cathedral building of Europe. Today, you don't find gods and, and kings driving major investments. So we're left with just sort of war and money. That's kind of what's going on here. 
But we haven't been honest with ourselves about that. If you go to Kennedy Space Center in Florida, there is that section of his speech. We'll go to the moon before the decade is out. And it sends chills up your spine because he galvanized an entire nation. But what's missing on the granite wall behind where this is chiseled in is the other part of the speech where he introduces the war driver. No one ever spent big money just to explore. No, no one has ever done that. Everybody was thinking about the future. If that was the bloodiest decade on American soil since the Civil War a hundred years earlier. Civil rights movement, campus unrest, 100 servicemen dying a week in a, cold, in a hot war in Southeast Asia. We were in the middle of the Cold War. 1968, the bloodiest year in that decade. Two assassinations. Apollo 8, an unheralded mission. Hardly ever hear of Apollo 8. The first mission to leave Earth and go someplace other than orbit. It went to the moon. Didn't land, but it went to the moon. December 1968. It orbited the moon, came around the backside. They held up a camera, and there was Earth rising over the lunar surface. That, to this day, is the most recognized photograph of anything at any time, of any object. Earthrise. And there was Earth, not as we had ever seen it. It was in display as nature would have you absorb what it is. There was Earth, not with color-coded countries. There was Earth with oceans, land, clouds. Do you realize no representation of Earth before that included clouds? No one thought to think that maybe the atmosphere is part of Earth. No one drew that before. And so you know what happens? You go to the moon, you look back, and it's a whole new perspective, a cosmic perspective. We went to the moon to explore it, but in fact, we discovered Earth for the first time. That takes vision. By the way, the first president of Rice University was an astrophysicist. Look it up. <laughs> what a private enterprise, they're there. They're gonna help out, but they're not gonna lead this. You know why they can't lead it? Because space is expensive, it's dangerous, and it has unquantified risks. You put all three of those under one umbrella, it cannot establish a capital market valuation of that exercise. Private enterprise comes later, governments need to do that first to find out where the trade winds are, map the coastlines of space. Then private enterprise comes in. That's how it's always happened. That's how it happened with Columbus. The first Europeans to the New World were not the Dutch East India Trading Company ships. It was Columbus, funded by Spain, in a vision that the nation had of exploration. All of you will graduate in some kind of major today. A major. But you know what your major is? You can boast what you know in your major, but at the end of the day, it's actually a stovepipe. You, you know a lot about this thing that sits in a stovepipe. But I just described to you the Apollo program that involved mathematicians, scientists, engineers, artists. Artists captured what this voyage was on the pages of, of Life magazine and Collier's magazine. Artists, engineers, lawyers, yes, there are lawyers in there too. It was an entire participation of a culture, an interplay of politics, science, technology, and who and what we were as a nation. So your diploma is really not a ticket to show off what you know. You know what it really is? It's permission to admit to yourself how much you still have yet to learn. 
And you know what's still left to learn? All the things that come together when great things happen in a nation, when great things happen in a world. As I said, the science, the art, the geopolitics, all of that matters. All of it. Nothing happens without some touching of all of those branches of culture. There is no solution to a problem that does not embrace all that we have created as a species. So I can tell you the original seeds of the space program were planted right here on this campus. And I can tell you that in the years since we landed on the moon, America has lost its exploratory compass. But I know the talent that is seated here, because I have conversations with my wife. I know who's in front of me right now. I know what legacy means. I know what happened here 50 years ago. I know all of this. And I can tell you that now is the time for you to lead the nation as Rice graduates once again. Thank you all for your time. <laughs>